Um, also, if anyone wants to take bets on uh, how long it will be before I trip over the, uh, over the uh, cables here, uh, that could be a fun parlor game too. So hi there. Uh, my name is uh, Greg Barber, and I'm from the Washington Post and from the Coral Project. Glad to be with all of you here today. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'd like to talk with you a bit about the Coral Project, uh, which is a uh, collaboration uh, between uh, the Washington Post, where I work, uh, the New York Times, and Mozilla, uh, the creators of Firefox. Um, and we're funded by a grant from uh, the Knight Foundation, which is a charitable foundation in the United States. And we bring journalists and the communities that they serve together uh, through open source software and renewed best practices. And I'd like to talk with you about uh, what we've done uh, over the past couple of years today and how you could use it uh, in your work uh, as we go. And I'm going to be talking about three main points uh, during the first part of this session before we get on to the actual software. Trust, relevance, and revenue. Please come on in. So first, let's talk about fake news, because it seems like everyone wants to talk about fake news. Um, so a lot of people are concerned about fake news. Uh, you might be able to find a panel here about that. I, I don't know. Um, it seems that might be difficult. Uh, and fake news is an, an issue. Uh, you know, certainly in, in, in my country, there was just an election. You might have heard about it. Uh, where, uh, where uh, uh, news that came from people uh, that were not looking to inform but were looking to uh, misinform uh, ended up causing some trouble. Uh, but fake news is a uh, symptom. The disease is that trust in media is declining. Uh, so this is a, a study from uh, the Gallup organization uh, from uh, uh, September of 2016 that shows in, in the US um, how Americans' trust in the mass media has declined over the years. And, and it's been pretty precipitous. And that also bears out when you look at data throughout the world. So this is uh, from the uh, Edelman Trust Barometer uh, released in 2017, January 2017. Uh, and you see uh, uh, the, this was a survey of uh, folks from 28 uh, different countries, in, including here in Italy. And, and what you see here is that uh, of the uh, declines in trust, uh, media declined the most, uh, which is quite problematic for all of us. So what can we do about that? Well, some folks have done some studies that are quite interesting. So uh, this is one uh, research from the Media Insight Project. This was released in April 2016. And it says that trust includes an emotional connection. People talked about a trusted source consistently meeting their needs and that they go to trusted sources more frequently and usually first because it saves them time and energy. So trusted sources are the sources that readers go to first, the, the sources that readers go to most often, and that trust involves an emotional connection, feeling like you are a part of that news organization's mission. And those who put a premium on trust, this is from the same study, um, also they're more likely to pay for news. And they're also twice as likely to subscribe to things like newsletters, to deepen that relationship, right? Because if they feel like they have a connection with your news organization, or even better, with you as journalists, they want to follow you. They want to see your work. They want to support your work. They want to engage with your work. And that's something that we should all be looking toward because it helps reverse that trend of distrust in media, which is, which is aiming at the disease, not at the symptom. We also need revenue, right? News organizations, we can't do all of this, uh, all of our great work and all of this great connecting without a business to support us. And digital advertising continues to account for a larger portion of all ad spending. This is uh, research coming from uh, the Pew Research Center in uh, June of 2016. And what it showed is that uh, even though in, in many places, especially in Europe, uh, print advertising revenue is, is still a, a great driver of uh, the money that helps to fund our news organizations, it's losing ground overall. And, and digital revenue is accounting for a larger uh, amount of that. And just a few companies are the ones who are uh, uh, controlling the majority of that display advertising. So this is in the United States. Uh, but uh, in the US, everyone who's not Google, Verizon, Twitter, Yahoo, or Facebook accounts for only 41% of, uh, of control of display advertising. That's according to the Pew Research Center. So news organizations need to diversify their revenue approaches, right? And one of the ways that you can do that is through engagement. 
Because social activity on a website can increase users' commitment to that site and their willingness to pay for its services. So it, it goes back to that trust issue, right? That if news organizations care about your mission and care about your work, uh, if users that is, not news organizations, but that's good too. Uh, if readers care about your work, they're more likely to support it. Uh, this, by the way, is uh, from a study uh, that was published in the uh, MIT Sloan Management Review uh, in spring of 2016. This was a really fascinating study because one of the things that it showed is that, uh, is that people who participate in, uh, uh, in interactive spaces on your news site are more likely to uh, climb a ladder of participation, they say. And uh, comments and reading comments are high rungs on that ladder of participation. So that gets people uh, to think more about wanting to interact with you, about wanting to interact with your organization, about following your journalism, about understanding right, that the, the journalism you're creating isn't just something that they saw on Facebook but is actually something that came from your organization or that came from you. I really trust that organization. I really trust this reporter. I want to follow them. And it's not enough, this study says, just to have participatory options out there, just to say, hey, you could send us an email. You need to have a strategy, an outreach, so that you can actually um, get users to, to interact by enticing them to interact, by asking them questions. Um, and you need to have a clear strategy in place to interact with those users and to actually make good on those requests. So just saying, hey, send us an email. Hey, hey, hey leave us a, a comment. That's not good enough. What you need to actually do is make good on that, right? So if a friend of yours said to you, hey, give me a call, and you called, or they called, but you didn't pick up, that's not really a, uh, that's not a connection made. That's just a call sent. So what we're doing with a lot of comment systems now is that we're saying to users, hey, call me, it's fine. But then we don't answer. So where's the value for that in users? There's also the, uh, the engagement factor. So many of us are looking to move specific metrics when it comes to our websites, right? We want to increase page views. We want to increase time on site. We want more unique viewers. Engagement can help you with that. So uh, the Financial Times, uh, says that readers who comment are seven times more engaged uh, than other readers. And I can bear that out with, uh, with metrics from the Washington Post. Uh, the readers who uh, comment are, uh, consume far more pages per visit than the typical reader. Readers who comment stay on the site far longer than, uh, than most users. They are more likely to return to the site and they are more likely to subscribe. These are our most loyal users, full stop. And then comment readers, which was a group that we at the Washington Post hadn't really even considered a distinct group of people. When we started looking at them, we found really interesting metrics there too. They, were about twi they read about twice as much um, as the typical user in, in, in a session. They uh, came back more often. They were also more likely to subscribe. And they were also more likely to spend time. A, a large number of Washington Post subscribers are also comment readers. So having engagement spaces, comments on other things, on your website is a way to uh, increase time on site. It's a way to uh, uh, prompt engagement and loyalty. And it's also a way to keep those users who have already become engaged with you and loyal to you. So it's an expansion play and a retention play all by having a strategy around interacting with users, which helps us in lots of other ways. So think about a marketing funnel. You guys have probably seen some of these. If you work in a newsroom, you've probably tried quite hard not to see one of these, but here it is anyway. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's getting the user to have a brand awareness, to engage with you, to discover more about you, to, to lay out some money, and then you keep them there, right? So for journalism, let's think about this in a different way. In that, uh, in that purchase area, Thinking, think about some different types of transactions. One of them is supplying ideas, because users can really help us with our journalism. Uh, think about correcting mistakes. Users are quite good at that, as we all know. Uh, think about becoming a source. Uh, engagement spaces are a great way to find new sources uh, for your stories. And then think about improving dialogue. That you can host a conversation about something that's important, and your journalists can help guide it. Think about it this way. Um, in radio, 
and on television, we have, for now many decades, um, had call-in shows, had shows where we bring in voices from the outside, and we as journalists moderate that discussion. We ask questions, the person answers, we keep things going, we make sure that it's civil. These are skills that we as journalists have. It's been part of our DNA for decades now. And all we have to do is translate those skills into a digital space. News organizations lack diversity, and, and uh, my apologies again, these are some American numbers, uh, but uh, the percentage of minority journalists in uh, uh, American newsrooms, uh, according to the American Society of News Editors in 2016, was very small, 17%. The percentage of minority journalists in uh, TV and radio newsrooms uh, uh, the, who responded to a radio, television, digital news association survey also last year was also quite small, 23%. Why does that matter? According to, a, uh, according to another study here, this one uh, from, uh, oh, the Media Insight Project, so back to that study again. Um, the users, uh, particularly African American and Hispanic Americans, were more likely than white Americans to say that it was important that they see their communities and people like them in the reporting. So engagement is a way, if your newsroom does not have uh, a lot of diversity, Engagement is a way to bring in that diversity, right? If you don't have those voices within your newsroom, get them from your readership. Ask, ask people from different bas backgrounds. Ask people who have had different experiences. Our job as journalists is to tell other people's stories, is to find those stories and tell them and make them and, and, and uh, tell them in a compelling way, in a way that reflects that story. And this is a great way to cast a much wider net than we can just by walking out to a supermarket parking lot and hoping we encounter someone with something interesting to say. Also, a large, uh, uh, this, this is from another study, uh, this one from uh, the University of Missouri School of Journalism, released in the fall of 2016, uh, that said that a large portion of the American public has expected political news to be covered in one way, while reporters are covering political news in a different way. The, the result of this study was that, uh, that political reporters see politics and the coverage of politics in a different way than the people who consume their reporting. You might say that we saw a very large example of that in the American presidential election, where much of the political uh, analysis uh, showed one candidate winning, uh, and reality showed another candidate winning. Um, that's one very large example, very outsized example, as with many things regarding that story, but, uh, but it's, it's emblematic of uh, an issue that we've seen sort of throughout political coverage, that, uh, that, we'll, uh, that, that there will be analysis from a journalist and we will get a different uh, reaction from the users. That's important. That's understanding your readership. That's understanding what your readership is thinking. Um, and that's a really important part of our job as journalists is to reflect what's really going on and what people think. Also, there's this, and I think, we all, I think we all may have experienced this kind of a thing before. If a reporter needs a quote from a member of each political party, the reporter is much more likely to go to someone that they know because we are all very busy and we are all on deadline and maybe not today, uh, but uh, rather than take the time to hunt down different people who might have more diverse viewpoints. If you've got your editor yelling at you saying, this needs to be in in an hour, you're not going to go out and say, okay, well, first thing to go is diverse viewpoints. You're going to instead call up the person who you know gives out a great quote and get that quote. So, so digital engagement is a great way to, to cast that net, to hear from people of different, uh, from different walks of life and then to be able to reach out to them. They want to come to us, we should let them. So, to establish and maintain trust, we have to make a connection. To unlock subscription or membership uh, funding, we have to uh, have a strategy that shows readers our value and the value of interacting with us. And then to remain relevant to readers, we have to reflect their experience. So to put it shorter, connect, strategize, and listen. And that's what we need to do as, as, as journalists, and that is what uh, digital engagement can do for you. And you can do it. And we can help. So how can we help out? Uh, so this is, this is the part of our show where we talk about, uh, talk about Coral Project software. Um, there are a few seats down in the front, by the way, if, uh, if anybody who's uh, coming in wants to sit down. Um, so I'm going to talk about two uh, uh, main uh, software components today. Uh, one of them is our Ask platform. Uh, Ask is a uh, form creator and uh, gallery creator. 
Uh, and what that does is it allows you to create uh, forms so that you can ask questions of your users, have those questions come into a database. Uh, there is a simple moderation panel uh, where you can see the results that have come in, and then you can mark the results that you like and have those display back out on your website. Uh, this is what Ask looks like, by the way. This is the submission manager. So you can see what a, uh, what a sample submission from a user would look like. Uh, so features uh, of Ask include drag and drop form creation. Uh, so you can choose from different types of, uh, of form entries, say it's a short, short answer question, long answer question, these sorts of things. Uh, there are standalone and embedded form options. So if you want to put the form on an article page, you can do that. If you want the form to stand alone, you can also do that. Uh, there's simple moderation, as I mentioned. There's uh, tagging to categorize user responses. Uh, so let's say that uh, you've asked a question uh, about, uh, uh, about the budget. And uh, some people uh, say, oh, I want there to be more spending on education because of this reason. You could label that as education. If some people say, I don't like the budget process because the government is corrupt, you could label that opinion. Um, th there are different ways that you could categorize these results so that you could much more easily uh, go back and find responses. Also, you could categorize results as, please call this person. This should be a source. Um, also, there's the easy gallery display so that uh, elements that you want to show back on your site can display on your site uh, simply and easily using Ask. Uh, the Ask software is open source, so it's free to any news organization who wants it, including all of yours. It is in production now, and you could use it today if you like. Um, here are some examples of news organizations that are using Ask right now. The Miami Herald um, asked about fake news. Who'd have thought? Um, uh, this, was a, this was a story they put up uh, just uh, uh, right at the end of March. Um, so you see what the Miami Herald's form looks like over there on the left. And then this, this is what some of the uh, readers of the Miami Herald had to say about fake news. Um, and if you follow me on Twitter, by the way, GJBARB, um, all of uh, the links to the things that I've put up on here uh, are right there on my Twitter feed, so you can just click and go find them. Unfortunately, I'll, I'll, spoiler alert, I'll let you know that the Miami Herald has closed the form. You can still, you can still see the responses. If anyone was keeping track of when I'd trip, 216. All right, next one. Uh, Univision, uh, which is a Spanish, Spanish language network uh, in the United States, has been using uh, Ask as part of one of its uh, uh, news programs. Uh, so on uh, television, they'll put a call out to say, go to our website and give us your opinion on a topic. Uh, this particular topic was talking about uh, uh, discrimination against uh, transgender people. Um, and uh, so you can see their, uh, their form over here on the right. Uh, this was the story over there on the left. Um, as you can also see, uh, you can translate, right, and use ask in, uh, in any language that you like. One of the things that you might notice if you're particularly eagle-eyed is that it says submit here, which is not the word for submit in Spanish. Uh, that is the thing that we have changed. Uh, so if uh, Italians in the room or anyone else, you wanted to use an ask form, you would be able to uh, uh, put the word submit into your language as well. Uh, Philly.com, which is the Philadelphia Inquirer's website, uh, used Ask right around uh, the election in November. Um, and they asked uh, users what uh, their experience was like at their polling place. Um, and they, they got uh, quite a few responses to that. You can see the, their questions over there on the right um, and uh, uh, some of the story there on the left. Uh, Philly.com also used a uh, data visualization that we built on top of the Ask platform. This was quite exciting. Uh, we paired with a uh, data, uh, sorry, with a design house uh, called Baku, uh, which is based in, uh, in Boston and New York in the US. Um, and they helped us uh, to build a uh, visualization using the Ask platform uh, so that users could basically craft a letter uh, to the new president. This was on the day after election day. Um, uh, that is why it was called Tell Our Next President, because we didn't know who it was when we created it. Uh, so uh, what users could do uh, was uh, open up a form that allowed them to choose an emoji that signified how they were feeling, and you can see some of the results uh, from the Philadelphia Inquirer there. Uh, this is how they were feeling on the day after Election Day. Um, we also asked uh, what the top priority for the new administration should be, and, and that was a, 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 a multiple choice question, um, and so this person said that the top priority should be the economy. Um, and then there was also a, a short answer space where we asked the user to say um, you know, one thing that they would like the new president to accomplish 
uh, in four years. And this person said, create jobs for people, increase vocational training, and have the government stop backing student loans. That was their opinion. Um, and so uh, after we got those responses, uh, as a user, you were able to click on the different emoji to see, uh, to see specific letters from people who felt that way. You could also click on the different top priorities to see letters. It was, it was really interesting. Uh, that visualization is open source, so anyone could use it for anything they like, uh, and it works on top of the Ask platform. Uh, so that just goes to show what kinds of things uh, you can build on top of Ask. Um, also, the Washington Post uh, has used forms. Uh, we actually use a, 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 an older form service that was one of the inspirations for Ask. So Ask was built using the learnings from this. But I bring this up because uh, I, it shows the power of asking readers what they think, um, asking readers for their personal stories. So one of our reporters uh, asked our readers to talk about the impact of changes uh, to our healthcare law which at the time looked like it might change. In fact, it looks like it might change again. Who knows? Uh, but, uh, but anyhow, when we asked this question, um, we asked users, um, how do you think the newly proposed healthcare policies will affect you? And the responses that we got were tremendous. They were uh, very personal. They added lots of texture to the story. Um, what we found is that using a form uh, as a way to engage with readers is good for the kinds of stories where you're not necessarily looking for a rapid fire kind of building of a discussion, but instead you want reflective responses. The user to have sort of more of a lean back experience where they're thinking about how uh, a, a, an, an uh, idea impacts them um, or a personal story about their lives. And so what we got back when we asked this question was almost 1,200 responses from, uh, from readers, which was tremendous. Um, and so our reporter wrote two stories based on, on this call out. One of them, uh, she found five of the respondents, um, interviewed them, did, did some reporting, uh, and then uh, constructed a story where she told each of their stories as, as vignettes. Uh, and then she wrote another story where there's a screen grab of that right here, um, uh, where she shows uh, where she talked uh, about the 1,200 answers that we received um, and gave uh, little bits of information about some of those responses. And then uh, put the form at the bottom of the page and said, if you have stories, please let us know. And so then we got even more stories on top of that. So what's great about this is not only that we had this, um, th this opportunity to write a couple of stories off of these initial um, uh, reflections from users, but now we have these users as sources. And if there is a change to healthcare, we could go back to those users in six months, in a year, in two years, and say, how did it actually, what actually happened? How, how did your life change? So we've now found people that we can interact with over time. And now, a special offer for news organizations. Um, so because of our uh, funding from the Knight Foundation, we are able to offer uh, hosting of Ask uh, to news organizations for a limited time for a few months uh, so that you can give Ask a try. Um, this is for free. The software is free. If you wanted to take the software and put it on the server right now, it's yours. Go take it. You don't have to wait for us. Uh, but if you would like us uh, to spin up a server so that there is no development time required for you to try out Ask, uh, if you go to uh, uh, a form that I will give you a URL to in a moment, I, I suppose. Um, also, I have it on uh, Twitter, so if you just wait for that tweet to come out, it'll be there. Uh, you can uh, use a form, of course, uh, to let us know uh, if you're interested and we'll get back to you. Uh, but we wanted to lower the barrier so that news organizations could try out, uh, ask, ask some questions of their users um, and see what the benefit is. Um, and then hopefully the benefit is so great that you say, okay, we will take the time and put it on one of our servers and continue to use it. There we are, there's that URL. So if uh, you want to uh, build forms uh, and do it today, uh, you can go to github.com slash coral project. That's where you can find our software. Um, and if you want to sign up for a hosted version, uh, just let us know who you are at bit.ly.com slash coral ask. And again, both of those URLs will be coming up on my Twitter feed at some point. But Ask is only one of our products. I said I'd talk about two. So let's get on to the other one. Oh, by the way, uh, 
before I do, we'll just talk about the uh, uh, organizations that are using Coral Project software right now. Uh, we've had some great partners uh, in, uh, in news organizations who have helped us to understand what their needs are, help to uh, um, test out the software, help to push it in directions we didn't expect. Uh, so I wanted to give them a shout out here um, and say that we would love to add your organization to this list. So let's talk about Talk. Uh, so Talk is our comment platform. Uh, it is also free. It is also open source. Uh, it is also built in a way that is flexible and extensible. So that we want it to be uh, the kind of software that we at the Washington Post, who tend to be very special snowflakes when it comes to software, we cannot leave well enough alone, uh, that we can uh, uh, change and, uh, and sort of bend to our will so that we can use it in different ways. So it is built so that your organization can also do that. Uh, it will have a base set of functionality that I'll let you know about in just a second, but then there's the ability to build plugins on top of that to take the information that's saved in our database uh, and use it in different ways. Uh, so talk includes, of course, a comment box, right? So this is what you'd see on a, uh, on a talk page. All of these styles and colors are changeable. They will adapt to your CSS. Uh, so you don't have to go with our color blue or our color gray or our font or anything like that. Um, but what it includes is a dedicated space for comment guidelines uh, and privacy policies and messaging. That's that blue bar up there. Uh, that's actually derived from uh, a study that showed that uh, if on the comment thread uh, you show just a, a summarized version of what your rules are, that actually increases civility. So we wanted to give news organizations the ability to do that. Um, you have the ability to direct the conversation uh, in that gray bar right up there. We journalists are good at asking questions, right? So ask one in your comments. Um, it can help to give users an idea of what it is you're looking for. Um, commenters can view their comment history here, if you can click on that uh, My Comments tab there. Um, but they're not able yet to see other people's, um, but that is something, if your organization was interested in doing that, uh, that you could do with a plugin. Uh, reporting and flagging includes context to help moderators. So if you click on uh, the Report button, which sits on every comment, uh, you can tell uh, moderators why you're flagging that comment. Is it because it's offensive? Is it because it's spam? Is it, is it something else? Um, you can also report usernames. Uh, so if a user is uh, using a name that, uh, that violates your site's uh, uh, um, discussion policy, then uh, a user can let you know about that uh, by clicking report and then choosing username and then giving us a reason why they're, uh, they're flagging that username. By the way, our moderation flow uh, was uh, derived be, uh, from conversations that we've had with moderators, uh, some, of, some of which I've had in previous years here uh, in Perugia, uh, but then others uh, from other conferences and other connections. We've, we've talked with dozens of moderators, hundreds of journalists in, in about 40 countries now. So um, all of the, the work that we've done here is based on uh, a lot of reporting um, and a lot of uh, other, uh, other folks' opinions. Uh, another thing to, to talk about here uh, is that uh, banned words, so we have filters for banned words and suspect words. So banned words would be words that you as a news organization want to be sure never appear in your comments. Um, suspect words are words that could be used for trolling, could be used in a negative way, that you would just want to have flagged in your moderation. Uh, so banned words, uh, 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 comments with a banned word uh, would be immediately uh, rejected. Comments with a suspect word would be immediately sent to moderation with that word highlighted so that moderators could see where the word is and see context and see whether it needs to be uh, uh, rejected. Also staff members, you can see right here that um, our creatively named admin uh, has a staff badge. So when your staff members participate in comments, uh, users can see who they are and see that you're paying attention and that their conversation, their contribution matters to you. Uh, talk also has a moderation queue. You can see what that looks like here. Um, you can see also, by the way, uh, what that highlighting would look like. Um, so that's uh, highlighted in yellow here. Um, so in the moderation queue, you can view all the flagged comments or only those from a single article if you have, if you have a moderator who is, to, is only supposed to moderate in one specific place. Uh, you can view the reason for why a comment is reported. Uh, that's sitting right next to the, the comment itself. Uh, links and banned and suspect words are highlighted, as you see here. Uh, there are keyboard shortcuts to allow for quick moderation. This was a request of many moderators uh, who move very quickly through the moderation queue. We wanted to allow them to do that because speed's important when you're moderating a, a very vigorous discussion. Uh, you can ban users directly from uh, the space if the user is, uh, is causing a lot of trouble. 
Um, and you can also uh, turn your uh, comment threads into pre-moderated threads. Um, and those pre-moderated comments are displayed in a, uh, in a different queue uh, so the moderators can keep track of uh, the sort of context of the moderation. Is it be are they seeing this comment because it was flagged by another user? Or are they seeing this comment because they're seeing every comment in that thread because it's pre-moderated? Um, the moderation settings from talk also include uh, flexible settings around pre-moderation. I was just talking about that. Uh, uh, admins can force all links to be manually uh, approved, rather. So if you don't want users to link out to different places, especially if perhaps you have a trolling problem or a spam problem on your site, uh, you could make it so that any time a link is, is used, uh, that has to go to moderation. Um, your ability, uh, you have an ability to copy and paste banned words and suspect words into this list, so you can see where that is here. Um, and we've also included a sample list of banned and suspect words and phrases. Uh, these are sadly only mostly helpful for uh, organizations in English, um, and uh, they are, it is quite a set of words, I must say. Um, also, our stream settings include uh, uh, settings that allow uh, only administrators uh, to manage them. So if there are things you uh, want your administrators to do but not your uh, moderators, there are different roles for moderators and administrators. Uh, you can customize messaging for closed comment spaces. So say, for example, uh, you automatically close comments after a week or two weeks. Uh, you could customize what that message says. Um, you have the automated closing of comments after a set period of time. You can see where that happens right here at the bottom. Um, and then you can limit the length of comments uh, to encourage conciseness. This also helps to encourage uh, civility. Uh, we found that when users tend to go on and on a bit in comments, um, well, A, most users don't read past that first screen, and B, it's usually because there's some kind of a screed that they're writing, and C, actually, usually they're just copying and pasting something they've put in lots of other places. Uh, and then finally, I wanted to just show you this slide um, because this is what talk looks like on the Washington Post. It has not launched there yet, but it will soon. Uh, we are in the process of integrating uh, talk onto the Washington Post. We're going to be testing out the talk beta, um, hopefully within the next couple of weeks. Um, and then uh, talk will be our new comment system at the Washington Post this year. Uh, so uh, developers are uh, working on it Probably not right now, uh, but, uh, but they will be working on it next week. So, talk. You can build communities of interaction. Uh, the way to get the beta software, it is there, it is free, it is available to you right now. Uh, you can go to github.com slash coral project. Uh, if you're interested in paid hosting of talk, so I know that uh, for some news organizations, the idea of taking software, putting it on a server you control, managing it, oh gosh, what happens if the server goes down? What happens if uh, we get a whole lot of uh, interest and, uh, and usage goes up and the server needs to be expanded, all those sorts of things? News organizations may not want to manage that themselves. Uh, we are currently thinking uh, of ways that we can help with that, that we might be able to host. Um, and so we're considering offering uh, paid hosting if there is enough interest in that. Uh, so if you are interested in that, you can let us know at bit.ly.com slash coral talk. Um, and then you can explore talks features yourself. Uh, there is a uh, page that we've put up where you can mouse over different things and see how they work. Uh, that's available at bit.ly.com slash talk features. And all of these URLs are going to be coming up in my Twitter feed probably in the next few minutes. So, uh, so you don't even have to write them down. You just go to Twitter and click. Uh, before I let you all go, I also wanted to talk about our research because we did a lot of it uh, before we, uh, before we uh, uh, created these products. And I figured that some of it might help you in your, in your daily work. Um, so one of the things that we did was we, uh, we worked with a group called the Engaging News Project at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, and we did a study of commenters and comment readers on 20 different uh, news sites in the US. Um, and we got about 12,000 responses. And the responses were quite interesting. I wanted to tick off some of the, the, the top things. Around 75% of the people that we talked to uh, wanted journalists to clarify factual questions in the comments uh, and wanted experts to respond to comments. So what that says is that readers are interested in talking to us and hearing from us and having us do our jobs within that space. They don't see the comments as something, as something different. Uh, they don't see it as something that just came in the internet box and we're stuck with it. They see it as a service that we provide as news organizations, because it is. Every other page on, uh, every, other, other, every other pixel, rather, on a, uh, on a news site's page is heavily scrutinized, right? We all know this. We, we are careful about what we put in each of those spaces. 
But, in, but for some reason, as an industry, we've not paid that much attention to what we're doing in comments. It's the space that, oh, I don't read the comments, or uh, I, you know, I, I write my story and the, and the comments down there, oh, they're terrible. It's our responsibility. It's part of our storytelling. Um, and that's what readers are telling us. They're telling us they, they think it is part of our storytelling. Just over half of readers want journalists to actively contribute, and just under half of readers uh, want newsrooms to highlight quality comments. And then about a third of readers uh, want sites to allow anonymous posting and want journalists to direct conversations and comments. It was a really interesting uh, study, and the full results are uh, going to be available on my Twitter feed. Uh, uh, you can click on the link there. We also, uh, so we went broad with that study. We also wanted to go deep. So uh, we asked a researcher uh, named Eric French at, the, at uh, New York University uh, to talk to 15 frequent commenters and talk with them in depth about what, they, about what they do. Like, why do they engage with news sites? And so they told us uh, they want to be challenged by a, d a diverse set of, uh, of uh, uh, smart people who offer views different from their own. They comment because they like to interact with others. Um, and they say that the greatest source of strife is disrespect in comment systems. Uh, and then also, I just wanted to say out loud, because I've heard many times the idea that real names, right? The problem with internet comments is uh, anonymity. It's that people are hiding behind a pseudonym. And that if we just used our real names, everything will be fine. Well, anyone who's watched a Facebook Live broadcast could tell you maybe that's not so much the case. Um, I can tell you from having run a couple of uh, different news sites that use Facebook comments that uh, having uh, what you say appear next to a picture of your child does not necessarily mean that what you say is going to be very nice. Um, and so uh, a researcher uh, named uh, Nate Matthias, uh, who uh, works at, uh, he's a, a, a PhD student at uh, uh, MIT, um, uh, did a roundup for us of available research on uh, real names and basically poked holes at the notion that, uh, that real names are something that can help on their own uh, increase civility. Uh, these are organizations that assisted in our research. Wanted to call them out because they've been extremely helpful to us. Um, this, uh, we've, we've worked together, as I said, uh, with lots of different uh, organizations in order to make sure we understood the full breadth of the concern. I wanted to give you a look at our team. This is the Coral Project group. Um, if you are interested in uh, using our software or talking to us about engagement, uh, these are the folks who are at the ready to help you out. Uh, if you're looking for uh, assistance with engagement itself, uh, that lady up uh, in the top left is Sadette Harry. She's our uh, community lead, um, and she will be able to uh, help you with ideas and strategies about how to connect with your communities. Uh, if you are interested in using our software and want to set it up on your own servers, uh, Jeff Nelson right over here uh, is our integration engineer, and he's available to help you with that. And of course, I'm also available to, to take questions when, you, when you've got them, especially right at the end of this presentation. Also, I wanted to call out all of the people who have helped us out. These are just some of them, actually. Um, as, we've, as we've gone through our process, we've had interviews with hundreds of people. Um, people have given us, uh, the, the industry overall has been so tremendously open and welcoming and giving of their time and of their strategy. And we wouldn't have been able to create any of this and give it out for free without them. And we'd like for you to be on this list if you're interested in talking to us or using the software, giving us your ideas, writing some code. We'd love to work with you. Um, and then this is the, uh, the final set of links here. So uh, because journalism needs everyone, including you, we're the Coral Project. So you can get ask at uh, bit.ly.com slash coral ask. Uh, you can learn more about talk, bit.ly.com slash coral talk. Uh, these are the ways to contact me. And I've, I have one last piece of breaking news, which is that uh, we had an organization uh, create the first plugin on top of talk. Uh, so it shows that any organization can do it. They've done it. Um, uh, it's uh, a, a group called uh, Taringa. Uh, they have created a uh, plugin uh, for a service that, uh, that they've created called Sherlock, which is an auto moderation service. Um, you'll be able to learn more about that on our uh, blog in the coming days. Um, I will tweet about it when that happens. So if you're following me, you'll see it. Uh, but it just goes to show that, uh, that organizations uh, can create things on top of the Coral Project. We can bring them back in, open source them, and make them available to, to other organizations. So we can all help each other uh, in the process of uh, connecting, interacting, and deepening loyalty among our readers. And now I'd like to take your questions.
Yeah, hi. Hi, uh, Georg Dahm from the um, German media startup, Fail Better Media. Um, could you maybe explain a bit what uh, differentiates um, Coral Ask from, from other survey tools like, like SurveyMonkey or even um, Google Forms? Because yeah. it seems very simple, which is a virtue, but um, what's, what, what can it do, what the other tools cannot do? Gotcha, yeah. So uh, what it can do that uh, Google Forms, for example, can't do is the ability to uh, create a gallery based on the submissions that have come in. So, uh, so with Google Forms, you can, you can get the information in, and great, now you have it, but now you have to think about how you present it. Uh, Coral Ask can make that, pro that, that part of the process easy by creating a gallery that sits right on top of that. Also, with, with Google Forms, you don't have the ability to, to tag comments in the, or uh, 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 responses in the way that you can in Coral Ask. Um, and that's really good, especially so, for example, say you're with the Washington Post and you have 1,200 responses right, coming into, a, uh, coming into a, a, a call out. You want to be able to categorize some of those as follow up here, if don't follow up here. Uh, this is a good long term prospect. Maybe this one isn't. Um, so so being able to categorize those things makes the, the work of moderating simpler and easier. Yeah. Hi. Oh, microphone's coming for you. Thank you. Is there a tool uh, which uh, allowed me to establish who are the top commentators on Facebook, for instance? So uh, we don't have an integration with Facebook, but I'm glad that you asked about top commenters because uh, one of the things that, uh, that we can do and one of the features that we're building on top of Coral Talk is the ability to find uh, your best commenters, to be able to find the people who are contributing in the most, uh, most valuable way. Um, so what we're doing is it's not an algorithm, it's just math. Um, so we are uh, looking at the number of comments uh, that have been deleted by users, the number of comments that have been liked the number of comments that have been replied to, uh, if you highlight comments, the number of comments that have been highlighted, so that news organizations can find their best contributors and spend the time interacting with them. So going back to what we talked about at the beginning, right, the idea of, of creating value for readers. What we can do to create value for readers is reward them with our time and reward them with validation. Because remember, readers say that they comment to have their voice heard, that they want people to, to talk back to them. So what we can do is track the users that have come in and said things that are constructive, um, spend the time that we spend in moderation on those comments and those commenters so that we can deepen that relationship. What that also does is it changes the value prospect for the reader, right? So let's say you want to have your voice heard in comments. What you're going to do now on a site like the Washington Post, for example, is you're going to say something provocative at the beginning, right? Right when you put your comment in. So that moment when it's at the top of the comment thread, most, the, most people will see it and people will respond to you, right? People are doing that all the time. But if we can change the value proposition so that getting a reaction is something that happens after you say something constructive, something interesting, something that adds to the story, that changes the value proposition. And that means that readers will come in with something different. Do we have time for one more? Let's, we'll take one more. Got one in the back? Hi. Um, um, speaking of the comment section, mm -hmm. you, you said that readers want the journalists, the people who create the content, to interact with them. Yeah. Is it possible to be able to immediately spot what comments were made by the people who wrote the piece or work for the newsroom? Yes. So we have the ability to mark your commenter, your uh, a commenter as a staff member. Um, and uh, that's customizable. So what we'll want to do at the Washington Post is we will probably want to change the font and the color because we do that, uh, but we will also probably add a little Washington Post logo um, so that it's very clear to the user that staff means you're a Washington Post staff member. Um, and so, yeah, and, and what's great about that is that there's a, a, an obvious visual cue to the user that the news organization is present, that they're interested, um, and that they're willing to respond. And we found that when we are present, that the level of civility in the, in the conversation goes up. Sorry, I think we're, we're about out of time, but I will be uh, well here for a minute and then right outside afterwards, so I'm happy to take your questions there. Um, also, I have stickers and cards and all sorts of things right up here at the front, uh, so please come, feel free to come and, uh, and help yourself to those. Thank you so much.